Hey, how you doing? This is RJ. Welcome back to my weekday interview videos. Today I have for you a conversation with John C. Wright, a prolific writer of science fiction and fantasy over the last 20 years, and of course, an award-winning author. And just one note before I begin the interview, my apologies both to you and to Mr. Wright for the sound quality for the video. Some parts of it are a little bit hard to hear, but that is because of a mix-up on my part. But despite that, I encourage you to listen through right to the end. Mr. Wright has some not only prolific things to say about science fiction and fantasy, but also enlightening things to say about the destruction of science fiction and fantasy that we've seen within the writing sphere over the last 20 years. Also, just quickly, I wanted to remind everyone that in the description are links for my two superhero graphic novels that focus on good storytelling and heroics. And there is also a link for the early bird signup page for my fantasy graphic novel, which will be opening up in about four months. Also, there are the links for my two trailers for my fantasy graphic novel. One is about one minute long, the other is about a minute and a half, so very short, but gives you a good taste of what the story and art for my fantasy graphic novel will look like, and then possibly prompt you to click on that link and go sign up on the Early Bird sign-up page so you can get a free exclusive pinup poster if you order from the campaign. All right, enough of that. On with the interview. All right, welcome back to my weekday videos where I have interesting conversations and interviews with prominent individuals about storytelling and culture. Today, I have with me John C. Wright, and he is a prolific novel writer. He has written, I think at this time, over 25 at least, uh, 25 novels, and that would also be on top of all of the short stories and novelettes and everything else that he's written. And um, you're an award-winning uh, author, also uh, having written um, a book that uh, was given the first Dragon Award in uh, 2016. So, John, welcome to The Fourth Age. And if you could tell my audience a little bit about yourself in case they're not familiar with you or your work, that would be great. Very good. Thank you for having me. I am, uh, as you said, I've won the uh, first Dragon Award for Best uh, uh, Fantasy Novel, but I also lost six Hugo Awards in uh, 2015, which uh, is I'm very proud of. Uh, uh, because the uh, awards at that time decided to to exclude people like me from the Hugo Award process. Uh, I've written about 35 books, uh, and uh, all I can say is that I'm all very happy that I had children before I got my first book published, so that I know how uh, where my priorities <laughs> where my priorities lie. Uh, I write both fantasy and science fiction. Uh, I have invented my own genre that's called uh, uh, cyber heroics because I was tired of cyberpunk stories just being about punks. And uh, is, I'm not saying <laughs> I'm not saying there's any books in the genre besides mine. Uh, and uh, aside from that, I have been uh, writing continuously since about the year 2000. And uh, uh, I'm not sure what else to say about myself. I uh, used to have other other failed careers in other fields, like many writers but I'm happily uh, writing now. All right. So in order to get into the back door of how you think about story, usually I ask my guest a simple question that seems to be hard to answer for a lot of them. So besides what you have written yourself, what would you say is your favorite story? Uh, I would never list my own stories as my favorite stories. Uh, I have to say my favorite story is, is The Lord of the Rings by J.R.R. Tolkien, followed very closely by The Shadow of the Torturer by Gene Wolfe. If you're talking genre, if you're talking outside of genre, I would list Milton's Paradise Lost as my favorite, Dante's Inferno, and the Iliad of, of Homer. I would list the Iliad up there with uh, one of my favorites as well. It has been a book that I've, I've read so many times, and um, I usually read the uh, Loeb Classic Library so that I can I can switch over to the Greek whenever I want to make sure I'm, I'm not missing anything because I, I can parse at the very least uh, a little bit in order to figure out what's going on. There's, there's so many beautiful lines um, in the Greek, and even I think usually I like to read the Richard Latimer um, uh, copy of the translation, but yes. A beautiful book's all. You are a man after my own taste. I also like the Lattimore translation, and you're more scholarly than I am because I only know a few words of Greek. Um, so 
when you're talking about the stories that you love, there's a lot more fantasy there than science fiction. But when I'm looking at the list of your books, there's a lot more, I would say, science fiction than fantasy. So do you try to merge the two genres or try to draw out um, a more fantasy element within your stories that are even science fiction? That's a difficult question for me to answer because I'm not sure I grant the uh, I'm not sure I grant the assumption that the two genres are separate. What I try to do is write science fiction in a fantasy flavor or background. Certain of my stories I try to stick closely with the protocol of science fiction, which is to say, I try to make the science as accurate as possible. Other stories I'm writing space opera, where I don't care how accurate the science is, as long as everything is big, gigantic, and wonderful. And in either case, I try to capture some mythic flavor and feel in my science fiction. So the the two questions are uh, one is about the genre, and the other is about the uh, the mood and flavor, the the approach. My approach is always mythical. My approach is always fantastical, no matter what the topic is. It's very interesting because in delving into my own writing, I try to do it the exact opposite. Actually, I usually try to write science fiction without any science fiction and fantasy without any fantasy. That is to say, if there's a way to explain it logically, if there's a way to explain it according to what we now know, I, I usually go in that direction. So it's very interesting to find someone who goes in the opposite direction and starts with myth. That must be, um, I would say, a very heady endeavor. Do you draw on any specific types of myth specifically ancient greek or roman celtic or anything that you just want to pull at it depends on what the needs of the story requires i'm more familiar with classical mythology than i am with for example uh, celtic though i have written a celtic short story or two but all i'm saying is in in for example my book the golden age because i was setting it in as far in the future as i could imagine i wanted to give it a mythical feel because mythology concocts a sense of deep time, a sense that vast amounts of time have passed between now and then. So to get that same feeling pointed at the future rather than at the past, I tried to give my characters names like Phaeton and Helion and so on, and make them into basically godlike beings, because the assumption of that story is that future technology would, would give us uh, godlike powers, if you say. But in that story, I was very careful not to make up any any uh, uh, illogical explanations for anything. The technology is, as far as I can tell, is completely, completely legitimate, completely scientifically uh, accurate. Um, in fact, I once took a mighty vow never to make up any astronomical wonders because the real astronomical wonders are already so wondrous that I don't think I need to make anything up. Do you know there's a star that is within 50 light years of us that is moving at like 10% of the speed of light and has a comet-like tail uh, uh, streaming behind it from its solar atmosphere that is like eight light years long. It's ridiculous. There's a star made entirely out of uh, 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 super uh, gravitically uh, crushed uh, degenerate matter diamond. There's a diamond star in the sky within within 50 light years of us. You know, and I used it in one of my stories. So. Uh, I don't have to make up things when it comes to astronomy. The, the, uh, the nature has already made up more wonders than I can concoct. So you mentioned um, The Golden Age, which I think was your, your first major novel. And I wanted to talk about that just for a little bit because there's so many themes uh, within that that I think are pressing not only for when they were written, which um, I think it was published in 2002, but also for today. Uh, I think you were a little bit looking into the future within your futuristic novel. Um, but can you talk a little bit about um, some of the themes that you you wanted to pull out with that novel as your as your first book? Because there's a lot of, of um, discussion about utopian societies where uh, people want uh, their stability and their safety, and they're not willing to... Um, to go to any length in order to do any work, really. There's there's um, basically a form of the internet there, which prefigures um, the difference between virtual reality and our physical existence. All these kinds of things that are coming out in our culture today, um, you you wrote about in 2002. Um, and what, what are those themes? Did you see those coming, or was it just really good science fiction writing? Um. Uh, you phrased the question in a way that I cannot answer without flattering myself. So you're either asking whether I have prophetic, uh, instinctive powers of being able to see 10 and 20 years in the future, 
or whether I'm just a really good writer. Neither is true. What I am is very attentive to the muse. What I tried to do, what my ambition was in the Golden Age specifically, was to try to imagine as far in the future as I could imagine what the ultimate evolution of mankind might be, uh, given the limitations of what I thought uh, realistic uta limitations were. My utopia in, in the book is explicitly not a utopia because it's not perfect and it's never going to be perfect. Uh, at the time, I was suffering from a, uh, a political mental disease called libertarianism, to which I'm still uh, very uh, um, generously inclined, though I, I now believe some of its precepts are a little uh, immature. But with all due respect to my libertarian friends, even they say utopia is not an option. So if you tried to predict a, a future where the maximum amount of freedom possible for any human being was allowed, and you had the most control over everything technology could touch, physical and mental, mind, body, everything, uh, and you could do things like download your mind into uh, permanent mainframes and, and give yourself a virtual type of immortality by making iterations of yourself again and again through the future, uh, and rearrange matter and energy according to whatever your needs were, uh, even in such a situation, there's still going to be wars and rumors of wars. And in fact, my golden age, spoiler warning, ends in a war. There's, there's, a, uh, there's a second uh, oikumen, there's a second civilization that rejects the assumptions that the first civilization is based on. And there's no, there's no peaceful way to settle the conflict. Even, with, even though both civilizations are guided by computers that are many hundreds or thousands of times smarter than any human being can ever be, you see. So the themes that got drawn out were the themes of exploring what humans are like when they're given maximum freedom, given the limitations of the fact that no one can escape the consequences of his actions. So a lot of the a lot of the things that you that you saw there were just me trying to deduce what people could do if they could both be uh, godlike in their in their abilities, but also diabolical in their self indulgences. You see, and, and we live in a slightly more self indulgent age than it was twenty years ago, and so you're seeing some of that. You're seeing some of the virtual reality taking over people's people's minds. And there's a movement now called uh, transhumanism, which I was not aware of when I wrote the book which apparently thinks my book is, is spot on for what they hope uh, the future will bring. Although, in, in, in all fairness to them, they think it's going to happen within a generation or two, and I don't think it's going to happen, if at all, for many millions of years. And I, I also have to say, writers are a tricky breed, and we don't. what we write down is not necessarily what we ourselves think. I can write a ghost story without believing in ghosts, for example, if I was a guy so foolish as to not believe in ghosts. But... But And I can write a story about human-mind interfaces that, for philosophical reasons, I myself might not think is possible. But there's nothing in modern science which says it can't happen. So, to sum everything up, in the Golden Age, what I try to do is live up to my definition of science fiction. Many science fiction writers and readers have discussed what the definition of science fiction is for, for a long time. My definition, my offering, well, what I suggest is science fiction is the mythology of the modern age, of the scientific age. It's, it's, we tell stories to try to come to terms with how science has changed our lives ever since the Industrial Revolution. And so I tried to write a mythological science fiction story, which is what I was referencing with your opening question. That's why I peopled it with gods. Now, that's not the only possible approach to science fiction by any means, though it is a rather ambitious one. I also wrote a book called Count to a Trillion, where I tried to show the non-utopian version of, of the possible future utopias. In other words, let me, let, me, let me sum up. In the Golden Age, all my superhuman computer beings were good guys. And in, count, and in Count to a Trillion, my superhuman computer beings are not good guys. That's the basic difference. It's very interesting that you put it that way. And just because, especially since you said that um, your favorite book would be um, Tolkien, is just that he wrote in a very similar way, but in a much earlier age in thinking that um, the computer or I say the technological, I would have to say the technological advancements that were coming and he saw coming and were being imposed upon the countryside that he knew um, was the mythology of almost an evil that he saw coming into the world. So you're saying that you are sort of drawing on that kind of tradition, but doing it more in a modern understanding of science fiction and not only the detraction, but the benefits that science will have for us now and in the future. Is, is that what I'm hearing? Yes and no. Uh, Tolkien wrote a fantasy, and he portrayed the fantasy version of industrialization as 
the machines and the, and the hammers and the wheels of Mordor and Isengard. He, he saw the dark satanic mills rising over the green countryside of England, and he portrayed that in a, uh, in a vivid way in his book. And his book is one of the most famous in the world because it, it captured the, the feeling and the spirit of the modern world in a mythological way like no other book have. And it's my belief that human psychology is based on mythology. I believe we think in stories. Uh, science is just a really literal story, <laughs> but it's not really the way we think. It's somewhat alien to us, which is why so many, so few people do, do it well. So think scientifically, I mean. But the golden age, keep in mind, I said, writers are tricky creatures, and we sometimes say things we don't mean to tell a story. It's not, it's not a reflection of my personal belief what I write down, though my personal beliefs do get reflected whether I want them to be there or not. Let me, let me see if I can clarify. The reason why I wrote the golden age is because I was once at a science fiction convention where a young lady stood up, and here she was as a child of the most privileged, uh, uh, generous, wealthy, and powerful civilization that has ever existed on God's green earth. And she, uh, in, a, in a woe begone voice, with her eyes like two hollow pits of sorrow, said, oh, the future is going to be so bad. Everything is getting worse. We're going to run out of all resources and end up, I don't know, eating each other like cannibals or something, something. She just, she just expressed an attitude of misery. And I said, I said to her in response, the future is going to be a golden age. We are going to we are going to increase in progress, even if there are setbacks along the way. You know, and so I tried to portray that in a story. Now, is the future going to be better or is it going to be a golden age? I, I don't know. How could anyone sell it, say uh, the uh, uh, certain trends are definitely negative nowadays? And I don't think I would have given so optimistic an answer as, uh, you know, at, at the age of 20 as I would at the age of 60. Uh, but again, like I said, I then also wrote a book that takes place over, over uh, uh, literally trillions of years from now until the end of time called Count to a Trillion, where that was not an optimistic view of the, of the future and what it holds. In fact, it was a rather grim view, you say. But the, the science fiction aspect of it is merely a speculation as to how the technology will change and how the technology will will change us, will change society. The, the mythical aspect depends on your uh, fundamental view of the universe. The libertarianism in Golden Age is fundamentally optimistic. Libertarians are optimistic people. Uh, some would call them naive. I am one of those, those some. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the, uh, the book, uh, Count to a Trillion, is uh, much more cynical, much more Texan, much more uh, regards things as uh, working inevitably toward entropy, working inevitably toward the end of the, end of the universe. And in, in uh, the bad guys in that, in that case were the people, I should say, the bad guys in both cases were people trying to escape the inevitability of death by uh, entering into a, a basic false understanding of, of the limitations of, of reality. And in a science fiction story, you can examine the limitations of reality by postulating a technology that is almost unlimited, that is as, as unlimited as can be imagined. Does that make sense? You can write a time travel story if you want to see what the end of the universe is going to be like, by just having a time machine go to the end of the universe, and you can just put it on stage. If you, to, to address that theme in a mainstream novel where you don't have a time machine, in a, in a, uh, in a muggle book, uh, all you could do is have the characters either have a dream or talk about it. You can actually put it on stage in front of their eyes. That's the big advantage of science fiction and fantasy. Now, I will say science fiction and fantasy, although I called them one genre, they do have this distinct difference. The science fiction story is talks about science is about the mythology of science, in my opinion. Even even so called hard science fiction writers, Asimov, Heinlein, uh, Arthur C. Clarke, clearly put magical elements into their stories, uh, uh, time travel or or telepathy or uh, uh, Arthur C. Clarke has, uh, in Childhood's End, has the human race turning into spiritual beings, energy beings, and flying off and filling the universe. Okay, uh, but that doesn't mean these stories are not science fiction. These stories are very clearly science fiction. But fantasy stories, which I think started with William Morris, are nostalgic. They're stories about the pre-scientific age, a, a nostalgic look at the medieval or classical worldview, portrayed as a uh, uh, portrayed in the modern in, for the modern audience with with a, with a bit of longing or nostalgia, you know, 
and there's a bit of there's a bit of um, belonging can include things like a Conan story where a person is disgusted with the drawbacks of civilization. Everything has a price. Civilization as well as everything else. Everything has a drawback as well as a benefit. Okay. If if you're talking and you want to emphasize the drawbacks of industrialization, you put Mordor on stage, and you put Isengard on stage, and you say the the magician in in the Tower of, of Magic has his has his machinery humming so that he can do things like use blasting powder on the uh, in the in the uh, in the battle against the horsemen of of, uh, of uh, Rohan uh, in the Battle of Helm's Deep. But if you de de depict the positive aspects of it, you write an H.G. Wells story about men like gods about things to come where people fly to far different planets and and uh and mankind spreads and conquers and so on and so forth but that's still that's still a mythical idea it's it's mythology taken from the colonial era from the age of discovery transmitted translated into the future uh if you're isaac asimov even he a guy who's regarded by uh, far and wide as a hard science fiction writer if he writes a story about the the future he writes about a galactic the roman empire in space he writes about a galactic empire you see? Uh, so the two genres are, 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 are Siamese twins. They're wedded at the hip, but they uh, one attempts to mythologize science, the other attempts to mythologize uh, pre-science. It attempts to mythologize the, the worldview of the medievals, as I would say C.S. Lewis does, or uh, J.R. Tolkien does, or the worldview of the classic, or the, the Bronze Age, which I say uh, Robert E. Howard does. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes, it does. Off of that, I wanted to just to ask about something you brought up when talking to that woman about misery. Um, so obviously, I would not have the time to, to read all of your books, but do you have a theme in your books that you pursue wherein you would see there being a fixed human nature that would be patterned throughout your books and you would play off what happens within situations to human beings off of that or because you're dealing with mythological and science fiction themes trying to push the ideas of human nature into different directions so that you could see if these ideas are true if there is any bending to them what what is your character development look like when you try to to write these fantastical stories You'll have to forgive me if I'm not sure I understand the question, because I think you're smarter than I am, so I think you're asking me a question that's above my pay grade. But I will say this, which <laughs> might answer your question. I don't believe Isaac Asimov, when he postulates that the invention of teleportation would make it so that men become phobic about walking outside. I don't believe that it's possible for if men lived on a planet where they didn't see the stars every once every thousand years, that they'd go mad at the sight of stars. There's several Isaac Asimov stories where he postulates that human psychology would change so radically uh, in reference to the technology and their circumstances around them that they're that they're almost uh, non-recognizable as human beings. I don't buy that. That doesn't strike me as being realistic at all. Uh, Isaac Asimov. I'm referencing Isaac Asimov's famous short, sh most famous short story, Nightfall, where the uh, editor John W. Campbell Jr. came to him and said. Uh, and read him a little snippet of a poem from, I believe it was Emerson, who said that men would glorify God if they saw the stars once every thousand years. And John D. Campbell Jr. smiled a little crooked half smile and said, oh no, I think people, if they saw stars once every thousand years, would go mad. And he said, and so he got Isomov to write a story about that idea. The story is cleverly set up. It's a little detective story where the archaeologists find, as they dig down, remnants of a burnt civilization once every thousand years, and they live on a planet that has six suns in the sky uh, arranged somehow so it's never it's never nighttime it's, the civilization has never developed the light bulb or even the candle they don't have such things and when the sun goes down of course the people all suddenly start going mad and lighting fire to things so that they can have some light to see by now it's a cute story if you want to tweak the nose of Emerson of Emerson okay but it's not realistic because Leeuwenhoek when he invented the microscope and found out that in every bloodstream are tiny little animals that look like blobs of nothing uh, surrounded by tentacles <laughs> are writhing in every single raindrop and every single dust particle in the air, didn't go screaming down the streets in, uh, uh, in the Netherlands, or uh, pardon me, in, uh, in, in, uh, uh, in uh, the, the, the lower countries, shouting, they're everywhere, they're everywhere, there's little creepy things, 
they didn't go mad, okay? It's, it's just not true. Uh, people can get used to certain things. People can get used to, through technology. People can get used to things that they weren't used to before. They can get used to being flung through the air in a metal can from one coast of a continent to another and being annoyed because they don't serve peanuts on the flight anymore. That's what we can get used to. Our nervous system's going to adapt to technology. But we're not going to change human nature if by that you mean we can create a utopia. If you think a technology can alter humans, human psychology to the point where we are no longer motivated by lust, wrath, greed, envy, and, uh, uh, and sloth, then you are sadly mistaken about human nature. It is my belief that human nature is the one thing that does not change and cannot change. You see, so to me, the interest in science fiction is to show how the technology, the, 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 the contrast between how different the technology might make society, but how extremely similar the human beings would be. The reason why you and I can read the Iliad is because human nature has not changed between that day and this, although every other object, physical object mentioned in the Iliad, the weapons, the ships, the, uh, the armor, everything else has changed. The social structure, everything has changed. We have nothing in common with with Achilles, but we can still understand when he allows uh, when he allows the father of Hector to take his son's corpse back for burial. We know exactly what he means. We know exactly why Priam cries and kisses his hands and kisses the hands of the man who killed his son. You see? So I fundamentally disagree with the Isaac Asimov worldview that thinks you can create a utopia by changing the system of what of, of how people do things, because the errors in life are not caused by a bad system. The errors in life are caused by the human nature, which is crooked, just by the way. Does that make sense? Yes. And you you prefigured um, my next question, actually, because um, for me, anyways, I think we have um, similar backgrounds because I know you were a lawyer at one point and um, I had done um, a legal research for a long time. Um, so I think in a very, uh, I would say, logical way, or I at the very least try to think in a very logical way. Um, and when I try to... Um, dissect a story and really to set down the pattern for the, any story either that I'm writing or that I'm reading, I always go back to the Aristotelian um, way of thinking about a story, which is a logical pattern based upon what is known and the assumption that, you know, like you and I would uh, put into anything, I would say, is that, you know, human nature is not going to change. So, do you think of a story in that sort of mechanical context or logical context that may be seen as mechanical or um, or do you see it much more as the muse strikes you when you try to write again i, I don't understand the question because you're smarter than me as best I, as best uh, as if i understand what you're asking you're asking whether or not i portray human beings realistically despite the unrealism of the setting the answer to that is yes uh the way i write myself is not mechanical i write as the spirit moves me i write entirely by intuition and by instinct i plan almost nothing uh, uh I, sometimes i write an outline sometimes i don't uh that's why i don't uh, my ego is not inflated when someone compliments my books because it's i just pass their compliments on to the muse or to whatever heavenly being has inspired me now i analyze stories in a very logical fashion when i'm reading them you say and what I analyze is I analyze to see whether or not the novelist is living up to his duty to serve the truth, because I believe novelists serve the truth. Well, we're not newspaper reporters. We don't tell the literal truth. We tell the truths that are more important than literal truths, because those are the, the, that's the way the human mind works. We, like I said earlier, in the, uh, we, we think in stories. We believe in stories. We learn things through parables. We learn things through experience. Life is a story. So I wanted to go back to the golden age just for a minute to to get more directed questions um, about your your first uh, endeavor into writing. I've, I've written a lot more books than that one, but I'll be happy to talk about it if that's the one you want to talk about. It's just that when you were speaking about it, um, you, you talked about um, the difference between, you know, um, what men can do and, and what they're ready and willing to work for. And I know at the very least, it seems to be uh, from some of the articles that I've, I've read about you that you're a bit of a, a Star Trek fan. And I, I always feel that um, I go back to I know it wasn't a very good movie, but I think it was the um, 
the last uh, movie that uh, William, William Shatner was in, uh, where they found that um, society in the middle of the briar patch. And there was a line in it that says, uh, when you make a machine um, to do the work of a man, you take away from the man. Now, I always found that to be a quite profound thing that was uh, hidden in a, a very uh, mediocre movie. Um, but do those kinds of themes um, play out within, I, I just focus on this first story because I think it sets a pattern for, for what you have afterwards. But do you see that? Is that something that uh, you would actually bring out in your story or even think about when you were writing that story or further stories? No. Uh, that's, that's not something I believe. I believe there's a trade-off when you make a machine. You, you increase the efficiency of the man. Uh, he loses some of, the, some of the benefits of having hands-on labor, uh, but it also allows him to trade, exchange the fruits of his labor for, with another man whose fruits of his labor is also being created more efficiently. It, it increases his, his available free time, which he might use for, for good or might use for evil, depending on how idle he is. So all I'm willing to say is that there is a trade-off between, between uh, efficiency and uh, some of the benefits of, being, of having hands-on labor. The Golden Age was written entirely as an optimistic uh, viewpoint. It was, it was a near utopia. Uh, if you're going to look for someone who, who thinks that the modern age has robbed mankind of their, of their humanity, of their spirit, you're going to have to look to, to fantasy stories because that's, that's where that, that theme would naturally live. I have never myself gone out of my way to portray that as a theme because I, I don't believe it. I think tools are morally neutral. I think you can use them for good or use them for evil. But I will say this. Everything has a price. Everything has a cost. And there's some costs that civilization demands of us, which I think are very high and which may lead to spiritual destruction. I don't, I don't necessarily think that our age, with all of our fantastic electronic miracles of convenience, is, is a better, necessarily better than either 1950 or AD 50 in terms of how our humanity is operating. So in other words, I partly agree and partly disagree. So do not go to the science fiction writers for counsel, for they will say both yay and nay in their answer. So, um, again, I just I want to go back to that, that novel, just because when you're speaking about it and, and um, I'm thinking about it, I wanted to ask the question that, um, did you draw um, any of these ideas or any of these patterns of uh, trying to construct this society, which again was your uh, allotted novel, you were you were allotted as being possibly the the best uh, new science fiction writer of the new century uh, for that novel, if I remember correctly. But um, when I I look at it, I see a lot of um, almost Jack Kirby uh, kind of storytelling in that. It, it's a it's a lot of um, the OMAC stories. I don't know if you're familiar with those, and uh, where there's again it's. A utopia that's not really a utopia you have people who don't really do their own work there's there's a lot of um oh what can i oh the fact that um the, the military is concentrated on one man that that's that's the omac story if you ask me so did you draw upon um any earlier stories for your initial uh, venture into into writing this um, original novel or do you even um consider um comics or, or graphic novels and things like that uh, worthy of your time uh to be a source of, of inspiration let me answer those questions in reverse order not only do i consider comics to be worthy of a source of inspiration but they're probably a primary source of inspiration for me because comics are the only uh the only uh, pure quill mythology we have in the modern day the superheroes are are, are are our version of the demigods okay that's one two if you liken anything i do to to jack king kirby you have flattered me beyond the point of reality. So I, I, cannot, I cannot possibly accept that compliment that you gave me. Three, I did not have OMAC in mind when I had uh, my Atkins be my one soldier. That Atkins comes from a Kipling poem called Tommy Atkins, where the military is neglected by the civilian society because they don't realize or recognize what, the, what it is that he does for them, which was the point of the character of Atkins in my story. Uh, four, it's hard for me to say what stories I did not take inspiration from when I wrote uh, The Golden Age and Count to a Trillion, because every major science fiction writer uh, that I'd read in my youth, I had some wry comment or some agreement or disagreement or some point I wanted to make, and so I put them in the uh, I put them in the story in a disguised form to make my to make my point. You know, so The Golden Age is a culmination of all of the 
far future FS uh, science fiction. Uh, it's it's a it's a rebuke to H. G. Wells, who I disagree with. It's it's my version of Last and First Men by Olaf Stapleton, who was a communist, and I also disagree with his 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 portrayal of what would make a a good utopia. It is uh, uh, it is my uh, uh, homage to uh, any number of any number of stories. Uh, Keith Lomer, uh, Gene Wolfe, Bob Heinlein are all are all writers that I truly admire. And I and I just ruthlessly borrowed and copied ideas from them. Even the word sophotect is not one I made up. I stole that from Paul Anderson's, uh, who wrote, in my opinion, a better book than mine. Uh, 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 and the name uh, I will be embarrassed if the name escapes me. I uh, it was called uh, Harvest of Stars. Harvest of Stars by Paul Anderson is where the name sophotect comes from. So uh, I uh, I didn't make up anything. I am inspired greatly by by nearly everything. Uh, in terms of comic books, I, uh, I'm a fan of Doctor Strange, who's one of the more obscure uh, comic book characters, and they've made two movies uh, starring him, one of which was really good. So um, I wanted to get into the cultural aspect a little bit of um, the publishing industry, but before I get there, um, I just wanted to ask very, I guess, generally, I know that you've written uh, so many novels, but do you find... Do you have more enjoyment in creating in large worlds because you're you have a number of novel series? Um, is that something that um, interests you more to create a, a society that you can build on and build on? Because you've done a number of, of really good um, short stories as well. But what is your your passion um, when you want to tell a story? Is it a, a, a an epic like the Iliad, or is it um, a poem like? Um, you know, um, he sees it's theogony. Uh, again, I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, I, it's not a conscious choice of any kind on my part. I am inspired and led, unfortunately, to only draw, to only uh, uh, spin out titanic epics. And so far, not a single one of my trilogies has actually been confined to three books. It's partly because my math skills are bad that I, I make trilogies that are four and six and seven books, but also because I don't like to say the word sexology because people get the wrong idea. So uh, I love epics. I, I think in an epic fashion. I try to copy epic ideas. I've only written one standalone novel as far as I can as far as I can recollect, and that was uh, Iron Chamber of Memory, and that's a book that came to me in a dream. So. That's funny you should mention that because um, I find, honestly, um, for what little work that I have done, uh, dreams are, are the greatest inspiration for many of my stories. Uh, the stuff that I have self-published just over the last year, um, that's that's where these ideas come from for me. It's it's more of a uh, unconscious thinking about ideas because my conscious mind is always yeah, so locked into the logical, trying to find an answer, trying to find a pattern for things. Um, so, yeah. Um, for me, that that is an expression of dreams. This is what I tried to do with my storytelling. I don't. I don't want you to misunderstand me. I mean, the entire novel, from start to finish, in, in its every aspect and element, except for the setting, came to me in a vision all at once. That's never happened to me before or since. That was that was very clearly supernatural inspiration. There's no my subconscious mind does not normally do that. As best I know. I am unaware of my subconscious mind by definition. So what it does and how it operates is 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 uh, not even open to speculation. I don't really believe there is such a thing. I think it's spirits. So to move into the the cultural aspect, and I don't know how much you can speak to this, but again, you've been uh, publishing um, novels since 2002 and um, been a writer for, for quite some time. But for myself, anyways, um, just to give you a little bit of background, the reason why I fell into crowdfunded comics, which is what I do right now, is because I found it an inviting space in order to um, put my material out there. Because prior to that, somewhere between, I think it was 2013 and 2018, I had written a, a novel manuscript and um, I got it edited and I started to uh, query and looking for agents and all of that. And in so doing, I really found that I didn't want to be a part of that world just because of the people that I would have to interact with. It, it, everybody is looking at the, the entertainment system that we have today, and I'm looking at it going, well, if you go back to the early 2000s, that was the novel 
system with the agents that were the gatekeepers and uh, only allowing, you know, women's fiction. I want this kind of um, marginalized group fiction and all these kinds of things that they would want in order to even represent you as an agent. Can you speak to how the the system of publishing for novels has, has changed over the time that you've written novels? Changed is not a word I would use. I would use the word corrupted and I would use the word died because here's what happened. Uh, sometime in the, uh, in the uh, late 90s and early 2000s, the uh, Science Fiction Writers Guild, the uh, Science Fiction Writers Association of America, was taken over by someone who was an ideologue. This is a guy that at first I liked and I wanted to get along with him. And uh, he and his, his with the cooperation of, of major New York publishers, started uh, firing and excising from among their ranks anyone whose political opinions did not agree with theirs, regardless of their skill and ability at being a writer. Now, these people, that nowadays we call them woke, but what they are is the same group as uh, the communists of my youth and the uh, hermeticists of the Middle Ages and the, uh, the Freemasons of the 17th century and the Gnostics of the 7th century and so on. It's, 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 there's one tradition of esoteric thinking that is somewhat, I'll use the word, utopian. And the utopians regarded as morally correct to be unprofessional. And by unprofessional, I mean you judge a man according to his uh, uh, political correctness, his, his uh, willingness to accede to your, your religious belief or your pseudo-religious belief, not according to the merit of his work, not according to his output. The, uh, now, so... The, uh, the woke people, I'll call them that because that's their, that's their current incarnation, though, like I said, they go way back, started taking over science fiction. And uh, so some major, some major uh, editors in, in, in my publishing house had gone, had gone woke and decided upon a crusade to excise people of my race and political orientation and religion from, the, uh, from their ranks. Others were not or were not as much, if that makes sense. So uh, uh, matters came to a, a loggerhead in around uh, 2014, 2015, 2016, when the Hugo Awards were publicly challenged by the brilliant writer uh, Larry Correa for being slanted against, based on politics, ignoring the merit of the the merit of the works. Uh, Hugo and Nebula Awards were being given to were being given to people based on their skin color, not based on whether the book they wrote was good or not. Or based on whether or not they they put certain uh, certain ideas in their books or or use the the right pronouns or so on and so forth. Okay, so people who would had no particular merit at writing would win three and five Hugo's uh, when people like Isaac Asimov had written had, had won two and Bob Heinlein you know won four and Bob Heinlein is arguably the, the most famous most popular science fiction writer of, of, of three decades. Okay, so so the 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 uh, the unfairness of it was simply monstrous and simply outrageous. And the fact that they simply pretended that they were not doing this at all uh, was also outrageous. They simply said, oh, no, Mr. Korea, that's not happening. So Lear Korea and I and uh, one or two other people got together and formed the Evil League of Evil and started a campaign called the Sad Puppies Campaign because Mr. Korea thought it would, be, it would make puppies cry if science fiction awards were given not on the basis of merit to people who didn't really deserve them, you know. And uh, we were roundly excoriated in a fashion that was, that made international news. I've never been in the international news before, okay. I was, I was quite flattered that I was thought to be important enough to be mocked by people in England and Australia as being a, 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 a neo-Nazi. Because for these people, anyone who opposes them is a, is a Nazi. Anyone who opposes them is a devil, is an absolute demon, and has no redeeming characteristics whatsoever, okay. Because that's the way that's the way the mindset, the esoteric mindset, works. They're not they're not willing to judge anyone on merit because the whole point of their of their philosophy is to avoid responsibility for themselves and avoid judgments of merits for others. You see, they want everything to be simple and black and white. They're the good guys. Everyone who disagrees with them is the bad guys, and that way they don't need to to engage in any critical thinking. So. Uh, I found out to my shock that I had so many fans who liked me so much that they were willing to crank out 50 bucks a shot to buy memberships in Worldcon 
And that's what you need to have to be able to vote in the in the Hugo Award ceremony uh, for the Hugo Award winner. And they simply flooded the zone. I had so many fans that they simply, uh, every single uh, short story in the short story category, but one was my, was a short story of mine. I was running against myself, you know. And, oh, boy, the, uh, the, the bad guys just wagged their finger at me, and they said I was being ungentlemanly by allowing my fans to do this. And I was like, I don't even know their names. <laughs> what makes you think I'm organizing this? I wrote maybe one blog post or two on this entire topic the whole time. Okay, so be that as it may. So I get nominated for six awards, which is the most anyone has ever been nominated for in any single year. There are people who've been nominated for more awards. A man named Mike Glyer, for example, has 50 award nominations because he gets he gets like you know five a year for, for 10 years running. Okay, uh, I should also say that Mr. Glyer, whom I do not respect, is in on it. He was one of the he's one of the guys who's in on who's in on the uh, the little circle fest of. Uh, of uh, people who, who are trying to corrupt science fiction as quickly as they could. Uh, now, they kind of succeeded and they kind of failed. They did shut me out. They did no award every one of my, every one of my candidates. So I did, not get a, uh, I did not get to take home a Hugo Award. But they also made it so the Hugo Award was something that neither I nor any honest man would want to take home because it's now, it's now a political award. It's, a war, it's an award for your politics. Now, don't get me wrong. I have nothing against political awards. The Prometheus Awards are awards given to the best libertarian science fiction of the year. It's the, the award is only for libertarians by libertarians. If you're not of their politics, they will not give you an award. That's fine. But, but the difference is that the libertarians say that's what they're doing, whereas the Hugo Awards claim to be representing the science fiction field. Me and my, and, and my people, me, me and the other guys who have been reading science fiction since, since the day we learned how to read, okay? So, the things came became corrupt very quickly, and the awards and the plaudits only went to people who towed the line. And even people who were on their side at the time, men like George R. R. Martin, uh, uh, who was was maybe the biggest name in science fiction in, in that year because he just had a show come out and everyone had read his books, as far as I know. Uh, they turned on him because he mispronounced some names at an award ceremony. They turned on H.P. Lovecraft, who's the, who's the most famous horror writer in our in our in our system. I mean, maybe you can say Poe is is bigger, but but some people think of Poe as a mainstream author. They turned on Arthur C. Clarke. They turned on Robert Heinlein, one who's their guy. Robert Heinlein is a guy who every book was trying to promote a uh, an anti-conservative, uh, libertine, libertarian, uh, 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 do as you will philosophy. Okay. The, these these people because of the, because of the way the esoteric philosophy works the hermeticist philosophy the woke philosophy they always eat their own young and I have to say I haven't read every book that's that's won a Hugo Award since that day I, I I try to avoid them but some of the short stories I've read were absolutely abominable and they had no merit they had no literary merit to them all and, and some of them were not even science fiction you know, you, you say so uh, I. Uh, I would I would offer that in these days, thanks to the miracle of the electronic revolution, if you can find a way to sell your books while avoiding New York publishers, then you you had best well do it, because they have fallen into a hideous lockstep now. They're all they're all controlled by Mordor, or something. <laughs> uh, and uh, the editor that I was working with, he has since passed away. So I have I have no one I even have any any sympathy for that's still engaged in the in the business. My uh, my uh, one of the agents for I have three agents and one of them was kicked out of a party and was uh, uh, his name was blackened and he was basically cast out of the uh, editorial business just by these just by the same type of cancel culture woke esoteric Freemasonry uh, that uh, that has been with us since the Bronze Age. The the esoterics call them the guys who think the guys who think they know better than you how you should live your life whatever you want to call that group their names change every five to ten years so that no one no one can keep track of them but it's all the same group they follow all the same philosophy and it goes back all the way all the way through time that's them they've taken over the publishing field avoid the publishing field so just one question off of that. So when I was, again, finding this out for myself, just by, by um, interacting with um, some people with querying and things like that, I ran across um, Brian Nehemiah. I don't know if you know who he is. He's a friend of mine. 
um, I, I did um, contact him and we had um, a little bit of dealings. He, and he read um, my manuscript and, and things like that. And um, he, he got me into really with a lot of the stuff that he publishes just on his blog and, and even on his social media, interested in self-publishing. But just off of what you were saying about the, the fact that there is no merit within the, the mainstream publishing, there, there is a lot of democratization of writing within self-publishing. And a lot of that doesn't have the merit that you would hope to see within uh, what you want to take as being good writing or, or future writers. Do you see that simply as growing pains for a new system that needs to arise or, or anything else? No, I see that as a, as a drawback. There, the, the, what economists call the entry costs have been lowered. Basically, anyone can get published these days. But the problem is the gatekeepers both serve a useful function and a pernicious function depending on how well they do their job. If the gatekeepers are devoted to promoting quality in their product, they do a useful job. Because of the principle of specialization of labor, if I can have someone decide for me to weed through all the trash to find the gem hidden at the bottom of the trash pile, I don't have to do it myself. But in an environment that's a that's an internet free for all, where every every publication is is private, I don't have that luxury. I also don't have the luxury of of getting publicity uh, directed to my to my books because now I have to do it by myself, and it's not it's not a skill that I have. It's not something I'm good at. Even even to this day, I do not make enough money from my writing to to quit my day job. Let me just confess, I don't I'm not a big enough writer to uh, to support myself by writing, and part of that is because. Uh, uh, the, uh, the the I no longer cooperate with the publication system. You see, so I, I think there is a big drawback to going to going independent. I don't think there's any system out there that that, that can compete. Uh, but but since the since the towers of New York are now completely taken over by by Reds by by the communists by the by the by people who are pure villains. <laughs> I, I wouldn't I wouldn't go to them if, even if I, even if I wanted to. No, excuse me. I'll make an exception. Bain Books still seems to be, be to me to be run by honest publishers who honestly want to publish uh, entertaining science fiction. So go to Bain Books. Sell your sell your sell your, sell your stuff to Bain. They're, they're still they still do high quality work. Okay, we're coming up to the end of our hour, so I usually at this time um, give my guests uh, an opportunity to talk about what they're working on right now. If you you just mentioned that um, um, promoting your books is is not something that comes to you naturally, but uh, here's a platform or another platform for you if you you want to uh, talk about what you're working on and what's coming out in the future in your name. Unfortunately, I don't have anything coming out in the near future. Uh, I do have uh, the the current projects plural that I'm working on is one called Star Quest, which was my idea of, I was so offended by the last uh, few Disney uh, versions of Star Wars that I saw, I said to myself, these people do not know how to write uh, space opera. <laughs> uh, and and uh, it's, a, it's a particular skill set that they don't have. So as a joke on my blog, I wrote up the make-believe version of what the last Jedi should have been, what that movie should have been like, that my my wife and kids made up during a one hour car drive home from some from some visit, and I got such a positive fan reaction from the from the make believe review of the make believe movie that doesn't exist in our timeline. But I said, oh, I'm going to write this up as a, as its own book. I mean, I'll have to change the names from Star Wars to Star Quest, but no one's gonna, no one's going to be fooled. They all know what I'm writing about. Okay. Uh, and uh, the tale grew in the telling, as, as it is, as it were. I originally meant it to be a four-book uh, series, and now it's going to be a 12-book series. But I did an odd thing. I decided to hold off on releasing the first book until most of the books had been written. I'm currently working on volume eight of the 12 volumes, but I haven't released any of the books yet, you see. Uh, my two other uh, nine and ten book trilogies are Moth and Cobweb, which is my fantasy story about a a squire of a of a media, of a of a uh, magical knight who's living in modern day South Carolina, a an intern of a mad scientist who's living in New York, a uh, uh, a sidekick of a uh, of a dark Avenger, a superhero and sidekick uh, who's an amnesiac, and a uh, 
uh, a novice who is a, a novice exorcist who is a, so these four teenagers are all members of the moth family the premise of that book is that there's one family that is the largest family in the world called the moth families and they are descended from moth the fairy who is the uh, the handmaid the uh, excuse me the manservant of titania queen of the fairies from from shakespeare and they live in the third hemisphere of the world which we just haven't happened to discover yet it's it's hidden from us by a by the mist of Everness. Um, and I've, uh, uh, I, I intended that to be four groups of trilogies, and I've written the first two trilogies, Swan Knight's Son and Dark Avenger Sidekick, uh, but I haven't gotten around to because I stopped to write StarQuest, uh, these other two books, um, these other two, excuse me, these other two trilogies. I also have my, my notes written in my, uh, my outline for the, for the continuation of my Sumwither book, which has which has gotten a, a lot more notice and a lot more applause than than uh, than some of my other books. That's about a young man who works in the haunted museum, who falls in love with the with the bosses, the mad scientist's beautiful daughter, uh, and he uh, accidentally falls into a uh, interdimensional portal uh, and finds out that he uh, that the uh, uh, the astronomers of Babylon in an alternate timeline never suffered from the uh, confusion of tongues depicted in the Bible of the, uh, of the downfall of Babylon. So they are all one race and all run people and all together, and nothing that they attempt can be denied them, because that was the, that was the reason given in the, in, the, in the good book as to why the confusion of tongues fell upon them. My assumption there is that in order to split a timeline, we, we've all read multiverse stories. We all understand what the idea of a multiverse is. But my take on it is, if you have a multiverse, if you have a split in a timeline so that an entire new universe comes into existence, where does the matter and energy necessary to create an entire universe come from? And I said, clearly it has to come from outside the universe. It has to be supernatural. So only a miracle can split the timeline. So there has to be a timeline where every miracle reported in, in literature and myth either happened or did not happen. Okay? So all I went through the uh, all the biblical miracles either split, split off a certain different timeline and... Some of the creatures from these alternate timelines can find weak spots or shadows, uh, little gaps in the in the division between the worlds, and sometimes creep over into our reality, or we can creep over into theirs. Uh, and that explains stories of things like cyclopses and mermaids. Mermaids are just humans who alternate humans who come from the timeline where the miracle of the withdrawal of Noah's flood never happened. The flood happened, but then it didn't stop happening. So that's where the mermaids live in that in that in that world. It's all water, you know. Except for the uh, except for the island of Mount Everest, for ex that's just one example of, of, of several, you know. So, uh, some weather is still on my list of books to to continue because I ended on a cliffhanger. <laughs> I ended on a cliffhanger and didn't tell anyone what was going to happen. Uh, but it, like I say, it's it's all written down. I just haven't I just haven't gotten into it yet. Uh, aside from that, I've had one or two short stories appear in anthologies. Uh, but my uh, my best-selling short story is in one of Larry Correa's anthologies, uh, which is set in his Monster Hunter universe uh, uh, background. And I was very much honored to be allowed to play in his in his background, so I could have uh, British agents, uh, you know, uh, my, my version of James Bond, uh, out there trying to shoot the mummy or the uh, or the golem from uh, from uh, black and white movies or from mythology. So that's basically what I am what I am up to. Well, I thank you very much for this conversation, Mr. Wright. It has been very illuminating, and um, I I wanted to um, talk to you for quite some time. Uh, we have a, a mutual connection uh, through through one of your your friends and um, one of the people who comments a lot on on my videos and uh, through my social media. So I want to thank you very much for coming and uh, explaining. Uh, a lot of what you know about storytelling and um, the publishing world. So thank you. You are far too gracious. And I suspect from the way you talk and the way you think that we are both uh, separated at birth, sons of a, of a common mother that we don't know. And I suspect the mother comes from planet Vulcan. Just That's just my theory to explain the similarities between us. Uh, I could tell you um, stories about my youth where I, I wanted to uh, just spend entire years acting logically. So, yes, uh, I think that might be the case. <laughs> Therefore, I will say live long and prosper. All right. Thank you very much. So, as I said at the first of this video, some enlightening stuff there. If there's anything you want to add to this conversation, please do so in the comments.
And I want to thank Mr. Wright once again for not only talking about his experience writing novels, but also his experience within the writing world itself. And if this has given you anything new to think of, hit like, hit the shield in the lower right hand corner of your screen to subscribe, and as I said, leave me a comment. And again, just a quick reminder that the links are in the description for my two superhero graphic novels, which you can get at the One Indiegogo campaign, and the early bird sign up page for my upcoming fantasy graphic novel. You're looking at some of the beautiful art for those in the background. And if any of that looks appealing to you at all, you might want to click on those links in the description and go on over and see if my graphic novels are for you. All right, I'll leave it there. I'll see you later. Bye.